Hi guys, welcome to the Swing Guitar Blog. My name is Jonathan Stout and I have for you another new Guitar Day video. Um, I'm not just buying guitars willy-nilly. Uh, I sold two guitars um, and I was inspired to do that when I saw this guitar get listed. Uh, this was at Eric Schoenberg's uh, shop in uh, Marin County, California, um, om28.com. Um, the way they described it was just an, you know, an extraordinarily loud and full and bassy um, L5 and um, I was inspired to check out kind of the the big L5s um, by visiting my friend uh, Kit at Old Town Pick and Parlor outside of Denver in Arvada, Colorado um, and he had a really great 47 uh, L5 that I just was really moved by. Um, it's definitely a different animal than say my 32 L5. Um, it's something that I, I actually probably have more use for gigging um, is one of these guys um, because 90% of what I do on every gig is just play swing rhythm guitar. Um, I, I love doing chord melody stuff. That's most of what my YouTube channel is about. But realistically, I don't have a ton of gigs where I just sit there and play solo chord melody guitar. Um, I have all, you know, all of our bands, all the bands I lead, they're all basically swing bands for dancers. That's our is why we exist. So playing swing rhythm guitar is most of what I do on on most gigs. Um, and something like this is actually, um, this is where it lives. And it really, really sings with that. The 32 is one of the most versatile guitars I think you'll ever find. The, the small body um, uh, L5 is just a really fantastic guitar. And um, over the last two years, I guess, um, um, I've taken it to three continents. <laughs> like if, you count, if you count the one I'm on the live-in currently, um, I've taken it to two other continents besides... Uh, North America um, and it, it's really great uh, if I had to keep one it's it, it only one it's going to be the 32 but um, I mean aesthetically a late 30s guitar like this is actually probably more fitting for for the style of music we play um, visually um, but just for chunking rhythm this is this is kind of the the, the, the animal um, this is a it's kind of second generation 17 inch L5. So a little brief history lesson. Uh, the small body L5s debut in 23, or they're designed in 23, um, and they're made till about 34. So that's about 10 years. Um, they really hit the sweet spot about 27 when they stopped making the necks so gargantuan that they were almost unplayable. Um, and those are the kind of like the ideal dot neck ones um, that are the most desirable. Um, they changed a construction thing in about 1930 where they kind of put less effort into the braces and I, i've talked about this in some of the other videos and, and online um but the kind of curved braces that they used afterwards where they just kind of put slits in the braces and bent it into shape rather than perfectly carving it to fit those just tend to not sound as good and most um from what i'm aware most of the block neck small body l5s are curved braced ones um, however there are lots of examples of um one of a block neck later L5s, later small body L5s that do have the original style bracing, whether they just had a body left over that they hadn't used yet and they just found it and they're like, oh, hey, well, let's slap a new neck on this. Um, or whether there was one guy on the team who was like, I'm not doing it the old way or I'm not doing it the new way. I like the old way. Who, who knows? Um, Gibson, it was notoriously inconsistent um, for all of that time. Um, so there's all sorts of models that are sort of in and out of spec things that were shipped or that were made but then sat on a shelf for no apparent reason and then were shipped later um so my 32 which is over here say hello um is a uh, it, it has solid braces and that's that's it sounds better than than some of the other ones and that's that's one of the reasons why in 34 they designed the up up the uh, the upsized advanced model 17 inch l5 um, they upsized Gibson upsized all of their guitars. Uh, Gibbs, uh, Epiphone followed suit, going from sixteen and a half to like seventeen and, th and, a, and a quarter or seventeen and a half. Um, so that that's what everybody was doing, and the goal was volume, volume, volume. Um, Gibson at that point switched to X bracing, which has a very different tone than the parallel brace guitars. Way warmer, way more balanced, way fuller. Um, but it doesn't have that mid-range honk that you need to project, and it definitely doesn't have the sheer volume. Um, so my experience was I, I had a uh, Gibson L12, which you might have seen the video for, um, and that that is a really good 
advanced model x brace guitar and i i realized that more and more after having got it gotten rid of it that 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 was an outstanding example of what an x brace guitar can be um but like in a swing band it sort of disappears even though it's putting out volume and and that's weird um at least for what i do it sounded great playing chord melody stuff around the house um but with my 32l5 sitting there i just would always pick that up instead uh, I think part of it's the ebony fingerboard, and I think that's part of what makes L5s stand out is, you know, whatever warmth and, and the sweetness that they have that Gibson kind of did a little bit more than Epiphones, which tend to be a little bit punchier. Um, I think the, the the ebony fingerboard really adds a zing to kind of um, go along with that warmth so it's not just dull. Um, but Gibson made those X-Brace guitars up until about 38 um, and it goes about when they started introducing the cutaway because I guess when they went to a cutaway it wouldn't the X bracing wouldn't work so they went back to parallel so they just went back to parallel for everything right about that same time they they lengthened the scale so instead of the standard Gibson scale that we all know is 24 and three quarter they went to the same scale Epiphone was using uh, 25 and a half which most people think of as Fender scale because that's what uh, all the Fender electric guitars were um, so that combination of bigger body going back to parallel bracing and the long scale there's a real magic there um, it's the magic that epiphone kind of had the whole time um, but combined with kind of the sweetness of a gibson um, and so that second generation of 16 and or 17 inch big body all fives there's a magic there and like i, I played my friend kits and that was just really killer so those were only made kind of just before the war and then just after the war um, so this is a killer example it's got uh, awesome um, bird's eye um, side or curly sides uh, and then a flamed back which is odd that they're not the same but they both look really great um, it's the original finish although there's a bit of overspray on the neck um, there's some discoloration from the pickguard gassing off um, uh, but I'm going to put a pickguard on it anyway I, I hate not having a pickguard I don't know where to put my fingers so I rely on that so that'll, that'll not be a problem um, the original Catalan tuners are, are in really great shape and work perfectly. Um, really, the only problem with this guitar is the frets are like practically gone. Um, and when I first picked it up, that was the first thing that sort of gave me pause is uh, this is like a serious canon, like more than any guitar, almost any other guitar I've ever played. Um, and uh, but it's, it, it was hard at first to get some of the notes to ring. Um, the action on it was a, a little bit too high. Um, so it was just kind of hard to fret some of those notes. And once we kind of got it dialed in and I could investigate it a little bit further, I figured out that no, this is this is really working. Um, so uh, I was able to use this guitar before I bought it on like six hours worth of gigs. They lent it to me. Uh, and that really sealed the deal because <clears throat> this kind of L5 really, really, really excels at being a swing rhythm guitar. It just, it, it not only punches through, but it kind of fills the space um, it's hard to describe because I mean the, the 32 is such a great thing that it kind of slices through the frequency spectrum and really has this nice cut and so it's very present and kind of high mids it just sits there nicely this is the same thing but it adds a body underneath it and it somehow keeps it's not muddy because um, I thought it would it might be muddy but it really just punches through it just adds this extra fullness to the sound it really makes the beat reinforce so um, I can I can imagine spaces where the 32 is still gonna have a zing that'll cut through better um, but this, especially live, this is really killing um, for because it's just it puts out a ton of volume, um, ton of fullness, um, and I, you know th there's something that got posted on bulletin board just recently that I wanted to mention. Um, I have this great miking setup where I use a little clip-on lavalier mic and point it at the top, and as long as I'm uh, have the monitor uh, set up so that it's not coming toward the front of the guitar. Uh, or toward this side of the guitar it's coming from from the neck side i can get a ton of volume without having feedback problems i mean a, more volume than i need um, and then i have a little mute switch so that if i have to put the guitar down or change orientation it's not just ringing uh, until i you know move back um, so if, if you've got a great setup like that or if you're going to go electric which i don't recommend um, why do you need a loud guitar um, well the thing is it's all about timbre and timbre is more important than volume. Uh, you want to fit that that frequency range, and it's why those X braced guitars, just from my experience, just didn't work in a swing band because they got lost. And no matter how loud you turned it up, it just sort of added mud rather than adding um, either body or, or cut. Um, 
there's something about that if you're going to be playing an acoustic style of music, you want to do it as acoustically as possible, even if you're if you need help. Um, and so the goal of the miking rig is basically just to allow me to get more volume so that it'll sit better with the acoustic environment. It's not to go amplified. Um, and a louder guitar just means more signal for the mic to catch. Um, and you know, the thing is, even though there's a microphone and there's maybe some monitoring, you still want as much of the physical sound of the instrument itself to be reaching the other band members. So um, even when it's mic'd up, having this guitar really works. And I will say the, the, the 32, I never, I would never want for volume. It's definitely way quieter of a guitar. Um, and it's, it, it's sweetness is just wonderful, but it, it, uh, I haven't, I haven't wanted for volume. So it's not, a, it's not about that, but, um, sort of a different animal, um, works great. I mean, if, if you have the choice of, if you, if you can never get a small body L5, like do it. It's, I highly recommend it. Uh, like what does Ferris Bueller say? If, <laughs> if you have the means, I highly recommend you pick one up. Um, but yeah, they're great. Um, uh, but if I was only going to do swing rhythm guitar, uh, I mean, I think I'd pick one of these. Um, so let's hear it. Um, I will say that this has 13s on it. The uh, small body has 12s. There's still a 14 and an 18 high E and B on both of them. So that's the same. But I found that 32 just didn't really benefit from having more tension on it. It already sings and resonates and wants to project. Um, and the more bigger strings weren't really helping that. Um, whereas this one, it just, it loves it. The bigger, the higher the action, the, the bigger the strings, it just wants to put out more and more. Um, so, uh, and both of them are using Martin SP 8020s. Um, I have been using Monel on and off, uh, the Martin Retro. Uh, and it just kind of depends on my mood. Sometimes I like the zingierness of the Monel. Um, and then sometimes I like the slightly fuller um, uh, 8020s. I, I think on this one, I'll definitely be using 8020s historically. In 1937, Gibson's catalog advertises that, oh, now all of our big rhythm guitars come with bronze, heavy bronze strings. So that was part of that changeover. Um, and then lastly, I tend to play with different picks depending on the acoustic environment. Um, I really like these blue chip TD40s. It's like a one millimeter kind of standard 351 pick shape. Um, and that's like my go-to, but I'll, I'll always have like a, a TD60, which is the 1.5, kind of in my little pick pouch just because sometimes if the guitar is sounding thin or shrill, going to a bigger pick adds more body. Um, some guitars need a little more body. Um, sometimes when I'm playing electric, it's just too twangy because of the way the amp is set or the environment. So I'll, I'll change picks. Um, I find that the 39 really loves the bigger pick. I mean, it really, really pumps it out when you put the bigger pick in, but um, I'm gonna and 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 the the, the 32 doesn't it, it much more prefers the the one millimeter um, unless for some reason the acoustic environment sound makes it sound thin in which case I'll, I'll go bigger um, so uh, let's just check out some rhythm here's a little um, uh, sort of something similar to uh, mopping and bopping like a rhythm changes in F sort of thing um, I'll last thing I'll say is uh, before I play uh, I, I with rhythm guitar I've I've stopped using the E string almost entirely I still I still finger it. But I'm not really striking it or I'm sort of half fingering it so that it's muted um, and I'm really working the D and G strings and getting kind of that inside movement um, I'll do like eight bars without that E string and then I'll add it back in just so you can hear it um, so let's do it on this guitar first <laughs> and bopping on that guitar. Let's do the same exact thing with this guitar.
there's like a real deep bass to this um, that comes through um, that the more mid-ranginess uh, of the 39 doesn't have. Um, and I, I noticed uh, that kind of through the microphone, you might get more you might get more from this, to be honest, uh, that's coming through this microphone. But like in person, um, I can tell you that like I'm I, I can easily if I hit it hard enough, I can peak the BU meter uh, right now. Whereas with this, no matter how hard I hit it, it's going to get to 70 percent and then call it call it quits. So this thing really does have more physical output, uh, more SPLs. Um, so let's do a little chord melody on it. Uh, the frets are really low, so it's a little bit hard to get all that stuff to ring out. Um, but like I said, I think I can make it work. I am planning to have it refretted, and that'll probably make a huge difference. Um, so. Uh... <laughs> switch there. So it's interesting, like the D and G strings sound a little nasal, um, especially compared to this. Um, but I find in the context of a band or even a smaller group, if there's a bass player, they're, they're going to fill that out a little bit. So that's going to give you more, more presence. Um, and then it, there is definitely plenty of richness um, on the kind of on the, the lower end of the G string into the D string and the A string. There's a lot of richness there. So like something like this. Um, See if I can give you something, um, some reference for a, like a um, something I can play against just to get that um, going. this list. Let's see what pops up. Let's not do that one.
play as much stuff as I can over B flat rhythm changes. So uh, you'll see more of this guitar coming up. I'm going to try and do some some chord melody videos until it gets refretted. It almost seems like a, there's not much point to try and do some of the um, chord melody stuff I usually do just because I really need those notes to ring clearly, and it's a lot of work for that. But I mean, uh, having used this at several you know big band gigs and and, and just swing dance gigs, being able to like whip out this TD60 and just be like. <laughs> If I, if I lay into it any more than like, uh, you know, it's still not the most I can hit it. I'm already peaking the VU meter. So I mean, that, that gives you a really great indication of like just how much power this thing has. Um, and even down here, it's got nice spark. Sometimes you get low. Here, the, the B and E strings, like there's no fret left. So, like, you're like, rings, rings. Oh, there, where'd it go? Okay. You have to press really hard. So, it'll get refretted and it'll probably be all solved. Uh, but uh, this is a great 39L5, and uh, I hope you'll, I, I think you're going to see a bunch more videos of it. Um, and I hope that that little A B test has been insightful because. Uh, it's not like there's a million of these lying around a guitar center that you can just try out and see for yourself. So hope that was insightful. My name is Jonathan Stout. This is the Swing Guitar Blog. Uh, check out campus5.com forward slash swing guitar blog for uh, more info. We'll see you guys next time.